So the, the agenda is just that uh, I will do a few minutes of introduction and then uh, I'll hand over to Eamon and uh, Eamon will walk you through the code for the, uh, the client side of the application and then he'll hand back to me and uh, I'll walk you through the server side of the code and then uh, we'll, we'll both do some conclusions and tidy up and so on. Okay, so uh, let me just start into the, uh, the background here. So uh, my name's Garth Gilmore. I'm the senior trainer at a company called Instill. So I, I was a full-time software developer for about five or six years and then I started training and terrifyingly that was about 20 years ago. So uh, I started out teaching C++ to C developers, then Java to C++ developers, then C Sharp to Java developers, and these days pretty much everything to everybody. Um, so uh, we specialize these days in Kotlin, uh, Instill as a company, we went full Kotlin, you know, where applicable, uh, about four or five years ago now. So that's our main thing. Yeah, but we do lots of other things as well. Um, Eamon, do you want to just say a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Jim Boyle. I'm another one of the trainers at Instill. Uh, I was a developer for about 15 years or so, and then about four years ago, I joined Instill as a full-time trainer. I occasionally do secondments into development teams just to keep sort of things fresh. Uh, the last one was actually React and TypeScript, so that's sort of appropriate for today. Um, but yeah, mostly I'm, I'm writing materials and delivering training on pretty much everything, but I do a lot of the front-end stuff and do a lot of the .NET stuff. So yeah, that's me. Very good. Cool. So as I say, we uh, we work for a company called Instill, which is based out of Ireland. And uh, actually, the majority of the business, about 80% uh, of the business is software development. You know, we build stuff, uh, but we also do training and consultancy as well. You know, and uh, the, these are uh, a bunch of the companies that we've done work for over the years. So um, we wanted to build uh, an application and show it to you guys. Uh, and as you know, these days, there's tremendous, tremendous choice, okay? So uh, if you're working on the client side, you could be writing JavaScript, uh, but you'd probably be better off working in Microsoft's extended version of JavaScript, which is TypeScript. And uh, what we have gone do lally over the past couple of years with TypeScript, uh, we absolutely love it. Uh, we think it's great. Uh, we use it all over the place. Yeah. Uh, but you could be even more trendy. Uh, you could be writing using Reason ML uh, or Elm or PureScript or any of the trendy languages. Uh, and then in terms of frameworks, um, you're probably using Angular or React or Vue.js. Uh, but even in there, there's a whole pile of optionality. You've got all kinds of different choices. So um, I, I've been building web apps in React since the beginning. I remember when the trendy way to do it was functions, and then uh, we moved to classes. You know, So if you were writing your React components and functions, it was wicked child. You know, that's, a, that's not how we do it these days. Yeah? But now that the wheel has turned, yeah, and functions are back again. But now it's, uh, it's functions using hooks to manage state and event handlers and so on. Uh, and in the same way, if you were doing um, Angular, well, in the beginning, it was Angular with um, uh, loading modules dynamically, and then it was Angular with Webpack and so on, and then it was Angular with Redux, and then it was uh, Angular with um, NGRX Store, et cetera, et cetera. You know? So there's a huge amount of variety on the, uh, the client side. Yep. And similarly, there's an awful lot going on on the server, okay? So uh, let's say you want to write a JVM-based microservice, okay? So forget about serverless, uh, but forget about Ruby and Python and C-sharp and so on. You know, let, let's just say you want to write a microservice, yeah? And you want to do it on a JVM language. Well, again, you've still got huge amounts of choice. So uh, Spring has been the traditional way of doing it for some time now. Although before that, there was Drop Wizard, you know? So uh, Drop Wizard was the first microservices for work I ever used, still a big fan, you know, uh, but string, uh, sorry, Spring is the orthodox choice these days, but even inside Spring, uh, you can do MVC, you can do WebFlux, you've got multiple choices, yeah, or uh, if you're doing Kotlin, as I say, we're big Kotlin fans, you could use HTTP for K or KTOR, or uh, if you want to build on top of Graal VM and get uh, all the performance improvements that come with uh, pre-compilation and hard coding various things and so on, well, then you've got Quarkus and Micronaut and so on, you know? So uh, we did the smart thing and we left it up to you guys, yeah? So uh, we ran a little poll and uh, we said, okay, uh, you guys tell us what you want, okay? And uh, unsurprisingly, whenever it came to the front end, uh, you went with uh, React with Redux and TypeScript, you know, smart choice, yeah? And uh, that, that would be what we would find that most people are using. Uh, 
Angular was my first SPA framework. You know, I've got a lot of love for Angular. Uh, I still use it quite a bit. Still, was still a, a good seller for us when it comes to teaching, but we definitely see React uh, getting ahead, you know, uh, mainly because React is quicker, more seductive. You know, so uh, Re React is definitely easier to get into. Yeah, uh, Angular has a big hump. You know, you, you have to learn a lot of material at the start uh, before you can even write a, a simple to-do list. You know, so definitely um, we see React leading at the minute. Uh, and then on the server side, um, uh, you, you were surprisingly conservative. You know, uh, we, we thought you would have gone for AWS or KTOR or something like that, uh, but you went for Spring. Uh, the new version of Spring, uh, Spring Webflux, yeah, which is entirely based around Reactive Streams and uh, and Java 14. Okay, so that was uh, de definitely the majority view. You know that that's what you wanted. Um, so, as you wish. <laughs> okay, so uh, we went out and uh, adapted some of our uh, standard examples using that technology set. Yeah, and uh, some bits of it went really well. Some bits didn't go quite as far as we wanted. But you know that that's the usual way of these things. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I'll hand over to uh, to Eamon now, and uh, Eamon can introduce the example and uh, walk you through the client side code. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to take you through the. I'll, I'll give an overview of the app, and then I'll take you through the code. And this is going to be pretty free form. So please, you know, drop questions into the chat and stuff, and, and Martin can uh, uh, moderate there. So let me see. So the the sample app that we went for is a, a little chat app that we've called uh, Stipe, um, which is definitely not the uh, the TypeScript logo backwards and the Skype logo merged together. Definitely not. And uh, our lawyers will take exception if you try to promote that theory. Uh, but what we have, if I just load up these browser windows, is we have this little uh, little tiny little chat app and we can log in. And we can log in, say, as a second user. And then we can uh, create a room. And when we create a room, it appears on both sides. So the, the two users, uh, the, the, the app is reactive here. And if I, if I write a message in the app here, then we can see that. And that appears in one font or one style and appears over another app. And then they can say hello back or hola and so on and so forth. And if we add another room, we can do that and we can go to it and we see a count of the number of people in the room. So as I join the room, the number of people in the room goes to two. So it's, it's, it's a relatively simple app on the server. We're doing things in memory, uh, but we just wanted to have something to talk around uh, and that's the app that we have. So I'm basically just going to go through and talk about sort of the moving parts on the client side. And then Garth's going to talk about the moving parts on the server side, but it's largely working like this. We have a React app, um, as the client, we're using TypeScript as the language, even though React would more typically be paired with JavaScript. JavaScript's still, you know, more popular than TypeScript, even though we see TypeScript, you know, gaining more and more. Um, it, you know, and it would be how we would choose to do it because we're sort of, we much prefer static typing. Uh, on the server, as Carl said, we're, we've got the Spring Boot app and we're using WebSockets for the reactive side of things. And we are just, we're not using any libraries or anything there. It's all uh, low level, hard coded. And then of course there's a REST API in there as well. So we're gonna be looking at React and the functional aspects of that. We're using Redux to manage state. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Redux toolkit. Um, and then I'm gonna be mentioning some things around TypeScript about, you know, why I like it and, and things like that there. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure of what everyone's background is and what experience they have in any of these three topics. So I'm just gonna pick bits that interest me, but if you have something that you want me to talk about, um, we, can, we can focus in on that. I'm, I'm guessing that most people have seen enough of React because if we look at like the state of JavaScript 2019, you know, 71% of respondents had used React and would use it again. So it's definitely like the most popular front end framework uh, at the moment. But let's just get into the code, uh, which is here. Um, and if we start off just, uh, you know, start at the beginning, if we start off at our index, uh, this is sort of a good example of why I like uh, TypeScript. I like TypeScript because this might as well be JavaScript. It doesn't look like TypeScript. I'm in a TypeScript file here, but I don't see any types because the TypeScript system has such good inference and as a superset of JavaScript, JavaScript is TypeScript, uh, but we can add types when we need to 
uh, to, to build in safety. But this file, the, the JavaScript would be identical. If I go and look at like another file, like say the config here, again, there's zero types annotations in this file, but this is TypeScript. Everything is, is statically uh, typed here. So for example, this, this production uh, config object, um, even though it's just an object literal, it has a, a, a statically known strong type. So if I say uh, production config dot, I get wonderful autocomplete and assistance. If I take something like the chat server variable here, which is clearly a string, and I try to write a number in there, the compiler's immediately gonna start screaming at me. And that's why I want it, because I'm gonna make silly mistakes. I'm gonna make silly typos. Uh, so I want the compiler to help me as I do that. You know, I, I wanna get immediate feedback. Yes, when I run it up or I run my unit tests, you know, it, it, it would find these things for me. Um, but this is quicker. This is just a quicker amount of feedback. And I haven't had to do anything to get that. Uh, the type, what type is this production config? The type inference is inferred that it's an object with a specific shape. So we can actually define types very, very quickly, very freely with uh, these type literals, um, but we don't have to because the system will do it for us. But we can actually break that out. We can take that out and we can say, uh, let's make that a type alias. Let's call that config. So now I've taken that type uh, and I've, I've given it a name. But now I've got two configs dev config and production config. Um, production config is of this type, okay? Which looks a little bit like an interface, not quite, but a little bit like an interface. Um, and then we have this one, which again is just our object literal. And if I say, okay, well, what type are you? Again, it's the longer for, because I didn't explicitly say this is a config, because there might be more than one thing with this shape. So in this case here, I've got two variables with two different types, okay? They're, they're different names or they're coming from different sources, but structurally they're identical. And this is again, one of the great things about TypeScript is it has one toe in the, in the dynamic world because it has to, to basically interop well with JavaScript. So I have this thing config here and I'm assigning it one of these two objects, but they are both uh, allowed to be config because they're structurally equivalent. And anything that use a config I can pass in an object as long as it has this shape. So these sorts of things allow us to write code that is really, really succinct and more like JavaScript, but with all of the safety, with all the immediate feedback, all of the, the refactoring and navigation um, and, and all of that good stuff. Okay, so that's just like a little bit into you know, TypeScript. Um, but we're doing React here. So if I go back to uh, the start of my application, then again, I'm assuming you've seen some React, but just for those that haven't, uh, just in case you haven't, um, uh, we're using something that's called JSX. And in fact, let me, let me go to the login page because that's probably the easiest to see. So with React, we're using JSX, which allows us to write these HTML uh, expressions directly uh, in code. So they, this is not actually HTML, this is the JSX. And this goes through a translation step to convert it into normal expressions. The, the, the translation is, is really, really trivial. So uh, if I had a variable X, I could just assign it some JSX like that. And I can use it anywhere where I need an expression. That would uh, equate to something like this. So the, the translation step is so trivial that the first time you see this, well, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, it's wrong. You've got HTML inside, uh, you know, you've got peanut butter on my chocolate. Uh, you've got HTML inside my code. Uh, but once you sort of see how trivial the translation is, you sort of just go down, well, it's just a neater way of building these object trees. Uh, and you can use them anywhere that you can use an expression. So I can create variables. I can have functions that return like this one. This is just a function that's... Um, uh, returning this object. I can pass these in as parameters to functions, um, anything like that there. So it becomes very powerful. We can use these with control flow. We can use these with loops, with, with ifs and things like that there and start to build up sort of complex, uh, complex expressions. Like for example, here, the main application is saying, well, uh, if the, the current user is not uh, is equal to null, then show the login screen otherwise show the home. So I'm just using uh, a simple ternary here uh, to choose between two blocks 
of, of uh, JSX, which is really, really powerful. But all of this is uh, using TypeScript. So everything is strongly typed. So we can see here that we can create a, a, a component really, really easily just by creating a function. So in fact, I can create a simpler one. And I'll do it actually just like this. Uh, if I can type that is. So that's all I need to create a component in, in React. And that's one of the th reasons why I think people really like React is that it's uh, so simple and it's so easy to create these reusable bits of UI. Uh, and just by creating this with a capital letter, this named function, um, then I can immediately, um, you know, use that down here, you know, which is pretty, pretty uh, powerful. If you've experienced Angular, although I like Angular because it's such a complete framework, the, the, the ceremony and the boilerplate code that's required there is just so much heavier, so much heavyweight. Well, here I've got a component written in one line and can immediately consume it. But as I said, we, we're doing this and that that's, would be the JavaScript equivalent. Uh, because we're TypeScript, we want to add in types. So this is basically saying that this uh, function uh, is, or this variable that contains a function uh, is of type FC, which is just functional components. And this is the, this is the standard way of creating components now. I mean, there, you can still create classes. Uh, do, 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 do. Why doing this? And this would be the, the TypeScript way of doing it. But generally speaking, Emma, there's React... just a question here. Yeah. Uh, Nick asks, FC is built into it, question? Yes, so FC is part of it. Once you have React installed and it's got the type definitions, uh, FC is built in. And, and the TypeScript support for React is awesome. It really is very, very good. Now, you can have components which could have inputs. So for example, maybe app takes a name. So what you would do is you would create an interface for this, uh, for this type, say like app props. And you'd say this will take in a name, which is a string. And then we would say that app is a function which takes um, uh, app props. If I can type, you can never type when people are looking at you. Uh, so now this is a function which will take app props. Now I'm not using those props, but I could, I could pass in the props and those props will be correctly typed. If I do props dot, you see the way I've got name and children. So again, I've got all of that strong typing. So immediate feedback that that's wrong. Okay, uh, and I know the type of it, I'm getting all my string complete here. So that's why I like it. And then of course we can do destructuring. So a lot of times with React, we don't take in the whole object because we don't care about the object as a whole. We care about the bits inside. So quite often what we'll do is we'll destructure right there and then, and again, I'll get my autocomplete. So now I'm getting passed in a single object, but I'm extracting out the bit that I want, which is name. And yeah, you can see there, this is, again, quite an, quite an interesting way as to how that's composed. Um, you can see here that the, I've actually got two properties, which is the name and the children. So what's happening with an AFC is it's taking the type that I give it, which just has the name, and then it's doing a, an intersection with another type. So within TypeScript, we can take two types randomly, like... Um, uh, has children, and then I'll say this is children, and I'm just gonna do it as a React element array. It's probably not that in the full thing, but there's two completely independent types, and I can create a new type, which is the merger of those. So I can say type uh, props is equal to the app props and the has children props. And now I've got a type that has this field and this field. So again, this is another aspect of TypeScript that, that that its, its type system is quite advanced and we've got these algebraic data types that we can do these operations and compute new types on the fly. And the library writers make awesome use of this. So, you know, when we get in here, we'll find that that's a shortcut for a functional component. And if we drill in there, we'll get some props and we'll get props with children. And if we go in there, there you go. So it's taking the type that I pass in and merging it with this other object that has children. And again, here we're using a type literal. It, it hasn't actually broke that out as a named thing like I did as an interface. It's just creating it on the fly. And this sort of freedom and ability to program your types is really, really powerful and allows you to remove um, an absolute ton of redundancy um, once you start um, computing one type from another. 
Uh, but the, the library makes great use of this. Um, so yeah, we've got our strong types. I'm going to take that out or else my app won't run and I won't destructure. Um, so as I say, we're doing functional components here rather than class components. Um, but then to, to use functional components, all we need is a function that returns some React element. Um, with the login there, we saw that because it was a single return, we can do it in a, sh a shorter form. So it's very, very, very succinct, which is nice. Um, but if we're doing something a bit more heavyweight inside our component, then we might need to be able to have some other functionality, some lifecycle interaction. And that's where we get into React hooks because it used to be that functions couldn't do very much. They were good for presenting, but they weren't very good for building more complex components. But now with hooks, we can use functions to attach additional behaviors to, to simple functions. Because if we think about what's going to happen, and I'll, I'll look at the room one, I think uses something, yes. So this one here, this, this represents a form, which is me typing the name of a room. So in, in our app, this is, ooh, uh, don't click that button, uh, is, is typing in this box, okay? So this component, as it renders, needs to retain the state of what I have typed in, okay? So we have to have something, you know, this, this component is going to run, or this function is going to run every time this, this component needs to be rendered, okay? So the function's lifetime is gonna be very short. It's just for the lifetime of the render. But I need something that lasts longer than that. I need, I need the state that's gonna last between renders. And what we can do with hooks, one of the things we can do with hooks is we can, we can introduce some state. So this is how you recognize a hook. A hook will appear at the start of your function and will begin with the word use. This is the pattern that they, they follow. Uh, and this particular hook here, use state, creates a bit of state that will last for the lifetime of the component, okay? So what it does is it, I'll not get into the details of it in this sort of short talk, but what it's doing here is it's giving me back two things. It's giving me the current value and a way to change the current value. But when this component re-renders, the current value will be retained. So this is actually the initial value, the first time it's called, but every subsequent time it will give the current value. So as it's updated, I will get the current value. And the way that this works is you, so the, the reason why they have to appear at the top, because you notice that I haven't like passed in any ID or anything. I haven't said, you know, like uh, room name state or anything like that. The way that this works is it just looks at the order of that the calls are made so it knows that I'm being called inside the render of a, a, a component and then it tracks the order of the calls. And therefore it knows that, well, uh, this is the first piece of state that has been requested. So I know that it's this value within my, my table of state values. Um, and, and that's why you have to appear them at the top and you can't put them, you know, like I couldn't put this inside an if or a loop or anything like that that would change the running order. But luckily the tooling, the linting and stuff has caught up that, that it will basically ensure that you're following those rules. If I put a NIF around this, the linter will shout at me and things like that. But it's a, it's a pretty powerful mechanism to, to, to allow these functions to be written sort of very succinctly, but then have these longer lived behaviors and, and life cycles. Um, and, and we see like a lot of libraries adopting this now too. So for example, one of the things that we're using is Redux to manage the, the longer lived state. Um, so that, that lives off to the side in another library called Redux. And with React Redux, we have some ways of easily binding these two libraries together. And that library has now adopted hooks as well. So one of the ways I can dispatch changes is using a dispatcher. And there's a hook to give me access to that dispatcher. And if you go back to the start, where the first class we were looking at, here is the way that I can get some state out of the, the Redux store, okay? So here what I'm doing is I'm saying, I would like to have the user is initialized state and the user current user state, and I'm using these two function calls. But realize that this is doing a lot more than just reading these values. It's, it's hooking up this component. So this component will automatically know to re-render when this value changes. So if this value changes in the store for any reason from any other component's point of view, this component will re-render. But again, it's always using this, this pattern of hooks, this, these functions that begin with use. And you can, you can create your own as well. Um, so I have a thing in the chat here, um, this one. I have a thing in the chat, which um, basically I'll, I'll not type it out, but if you, if you get to the end of the chat, 
and you type new messages, it always scrolls to the bottom. So what you can do is the way that this is works is it gets a reference to an element and it, it basically scrolls every time the component re-renders. Um, but what we can do is we can sort of lift that logic and don't worry so much about the logic, but just realize we can lift that logic, which might use other hooks. This is using uh, an effect hook and a reference hook. We can lift that logic out, push it into this custom uh, hook, and then we can make that easier for uh, other components to use that functionality. So now I can basically use this single custom hook uh, and my component now has this auto scroll functionality. And if I have another component that I want to auto scroll, I can, I can attach it there as well, uh, which is quite nice. Um, okay, anything else interesting around hooks? Probably not. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Redux then. So we've got React, we've got hooks, that's nice. We used a little bit of state for our room, but what about more overarching state, lots of state. And you're probably gonna to wanna to get into some sort of state management system. Um, and there's quite a few out there that you can use. Redux is probably the most popular. Um, and one of the downsides about Redux was the amount of boilerplate code that you could you had to write. And it was relatively easy to, to break out your own helpers to try and streamline some of this process. Um, but, but Redux Toolkit has come along and it actually does a lot of this for us now. So if you're familiar with Redux, but you haven't seen Toolkit, this should be interesting. If you haven't seen Redux before, I'm not gonna go into um, the way that you used to do it, but just realize that it was more work. Just, just take my word for it. Uh, but now what we have with Redux Toolkit is we've got a series of helpers, okay? So what we can do with Redux is we can divide up sort of functional areas of our application uh, into uh, separate parts of state and behavior, okay? Um, and what we do with Redux Toolkit is we create something called a slice. And this groups together all of the moving parts of, of Redux. So with Redux, we basically have our tree and we, can, we have a store which manages our state and we can bind our store to any of our components, okay? So for example, our app there was using the is initialized state. And when our store changes, it tells the component, hey, you need to re-render. And the way that the store can change is you dispatch actions. And these are just simple objects that say, this has happened, okay? Um, and the way that you would code this up is you would have coded the actions and you would have coded the reducer, and then you would have coded the initial state, and then you would have combined them and done all of these things. Um, the way that it works with, tool, with Toolkit is that you can create a slice which sort of brings all of this stuff together, okay? So here I've defined the shape of my data and I don't actually even need to do this. There's a way you can derive this, but I wanted to be a bit more explicit here. But I've, I've got the shape of my data. So in this part of the app, in the chat part of the app, I've got a socket and I've got some messages and I've got a flag to say whether or not I'm sending and so on. And then I create a slice, I give it a name and then I define that initial state, okay? So I have an initial state with values for all of those properties. And then I define what can happen to my state, okay? So I can set the room name, I can set a, chart, uh, a socket, I can do uh, a load of all of the, the messages uh, and these sorts of things. And I'm just defining these as, as methods inside this reducers block. Uh, and then what I do inside here is I, I change the state. So everything has to be done with these synchronous changes of state. Given a state and given an action, What's the new state, okay? So given a state and given an action which contains a string, which is setting the room name, what's the change? And the change is state.currentRoomName is equal to the new name, okay? What happens when um, uh, the socket is connected? Well, set the socket and then uh, clear the messages. Okay, so you can basically set up these changes. And the way that this used to work again was that everything is based upon immutable data structures. Everything had to be immutable. So you would take a state, it would be a pure function. You would take a state, take an action, and then you needed to return a, completely, a complete state object. You couldn't mutate it. Everything had to be done through uh, immutable data structures. And this is fine for a lot of things and, and JavaScript does this quite well and there's some immutable libraries. Um, but for some things, it was just a bit clunkier. So what the, the toolkit is doing here is it's actually allowing me to mutate the state inside these methods. What's happening under the hood is, is using another library called Immer and it tracks the changes. So it tracks the changes, knows what has been changed inside this object and then does the immutable data change. So it passes a proxy object into this function and we're not really mutating the state. Instead, we're mutating the proxy. It's tracking those changes 
and then the 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 actual change within Redux is still immutable. So Redux under the hood is still working the exact same way. And when we're working with these immutable data structures, some there's some interesting things that we can do. Um, you know, the, the, there's always a demo where you do time traveling and stuff, which is not that useful. But uh, the speed of checking for change uh, differences is obviously very, very quick. Because with immutable data, you just need to say, you know, to track if any part of the object is different, you just say, is it a different object? Because no part of it can be different unless the object is, is itself is different. So those sort of differing algorithms are, are really, really fast under these sorts of systems. Um, and Emmer's pretty fast. It wouldn't be as fast as if you're doing it yourself, but the convenience versus speed thing is, is, is totally worth it. So we just create these slices again. Notice that I haven't done much typing here, um, but what this slice then exposes is a reducer type and the actions, which are the objects that I can then use within my UI to make these things happen, make a chat load happen and stuff. And notice that the type of actions here, you know, has all of my methods already in there. Everything is strongly typed. Which is pretty, which is pretty impressive. Um, and again, all I've done is define these. But notice that to do a set room name, what I would do is I would call uh, set room name. So I would do uh, chat slice actions if I wasn't if I wasn't importing it. Set room name here. If I look at the parameters, it just takes the the payload type, which in this case is going to be a, a string. So even though I've defined a method up here, which is taking a state and an action, which is one of these action objects that contains a string, the, the object that it's exposed from the slice has been derived to be just the payload, which is again, pretty impressive. So the, the, the strong typing here is, is really, really good uh, and works well within TypeScript, uh, which is quite nice. It does some other things too as well, the toolkit. It makes it uh, a wee bit easier to create stores. Um, so um, there's a configure store now. Again, if you've used Redux before, you use create store. The configure store um, wires in some default middleware when we're doing debugging and things like that, which is quite nice. Um, there's some functions for creating other actions. So we might want to create other actions as well. Um, and we can, we can wire those in directly in this this extra reducer section, uh, which is all quite nice too. Um, so again, like a lot of this stuff is um, uh, made available because of advanced, uh, the advanced type system that TypeScript has. So like one, one example of that would be around some of the messages that we're transmitting. So as we're working with a socket, the socket's gonna be sending messages back and forth. And we have, let's see, uh, do I wanna do this one? Um, don't think, yeah, I want to use this one. So this one here. So here we've got three different kinds of messages that might come down the wire uh, from, from the server, okay? It might be a message to say that there's a new IM, which has uh, got a message uh, field of type IM. It might be all the messages, which is a messages field, which is an IM array, or it might be the user count has changed and that has a count, which is a number, okay? So what I can do is I can take these three separate types and I can derive a new type, which is the, the union of those three types. So I can say, well, there's this thing called an IM WebSocket message, and that's either going to be a new IM message, an all IMs message, or a user count message. And again, create these things on the fly. And this is, this is super powerful. Uh, one example of where you can use this sort of stuff. Here, this is the, the handler for the WebSocket to process messages. And I've said, well, it's going to be one of these things, right? Now, if I look at that message and I see, you know, what will the compiler allow me to do? It doesn't let me do much. It only lets me do ID, okay? It doesn't let me do count, for example, okay? That's not allowed because at this point, it could be any one of the three messages uh, in our union, okay? So the only thing that's common with our three types is this thing called ID. So the type system is clever enough that it'll look at the types and it will only allow you to use the common bits, but it goes further because what we can do is we can do a, a, a type guard on, on, on this object. So we can say, okay, uh, what is the ID of our message? And if we say, well, the ID is all IMs, well, the type system, not only does the logic follow, the type system is clever enough to know that within this block of code where we have checked ID, if I look at message, 
it now allows me to use messages. So it has figured out, well, it was one of these three things. Well, I've narrowed down a bit because I know what the ID is and that then does a smart cast and it knows that message is actually of type all IMs. It also knows if I do new IM that I can do a message because message is actually a new IM message. If it says user count, then again, it's done a smart cast and it's a user count message and it allows me to do count. So it's got this type safety all the way, but again, I haven't really done much here other than the normal logic that I would have to do anyway. But now I've got this type safety, the autocomplete, the navigation, um, all of that good stuff. And again, it can be, it can do exhaustive checks as well on the types uh, and, and things like that there. So it's a, a really, really powerful type system if you haven't used it. Um, and I would definitely recommend that you give TypeScript a go if you're, if you're doing JavaScript. And if, you're, if you like React and you like Redux, um, again, it works really, really well uh, with those systems. Um, so I could talk for ages about all of this stuff um, and I could drill into different things. There's some other interesting things in here. Uh, if you're a React fan, um, there's some modules, there's some CSS modules so this is this is quite interesting if you haven't used this. So this allows us to bring in. Evan, uh, there is just a question here from yeah. Christian. Uh, I'm just going to interrupt you. Are there any specific plugins used for WebStorm for this to happen? No, no. This is just out of the box WebStorm, which again is is why I prefer using WebStorm to something like VS Code, where you have to configure loads and loads of plugins. Um, there's no plugins here. This is just WebStorm with TypeScript language support and. Yeah, that's 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 it. Uh, the only one that I, the plugin that I use around this stuff is if I was using style components. And um, with style components, you know, um, I don't have it installed here, but you'd actually be writing, um, you know, uh, CSS inside yeah. a, a templated string, and and that would be the only thing I would use a, a plugin for. But uh, no, this is all standard stuff. Yeah. For this one here, for the module stuff, this is a plugin for Webpack. This is a preprocessor. So sorry, I thought the, the, the question was maybe about the language. Maybe it's about CSS modules, is it? Um, there's, yeah, he just added, can you maybe show the editor setting for the language uh, level support for TS? So oh, for the level, the yeah. Uh, the language level support. So this this one is just, I, do, I have not played with that setting. So I have just literally just done, this is the latest version of WebStorm. I am using 3.9, I think, of TypeScript. Let's see in this project. Hello? Oh, I'm actually Hello? using four here, but it will work the same with 3.9. Tyson, you're welcome to put on your, your sound if you want to ask the question instead. We, we have to... Yeah, hello. I realized I can unmute myself. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hey, so it would be much faster like this. Uh, do you uh, enable the language support uh, so that uh, it knows it's a JSX uh, version uh, of uh, TypeScript? That's uh, what yes, I'm yes. So yes, that that yeah. that so that's the setting JSX is version. Okay, good. Yes, okay, but the, I again, I've I've not really had to go into the settings to set that. It it is set, um, but just by having the project and having the files with a JSX, mm -hmm. I think maybe the first time you do that. There's like a little bar appears here and you just click the button. Yeah, yeah. when you create a new React project, have to support it's automatically JSX. set. Yeah. yeah, but 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 I didn't have to install a plugin for that. That was just, I just had to enable that. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank but you that's, very much. That's more for this side of things. The, I, I wasn't sure if you were asking about the unions and the smart casts. All of this stuff is obviously uh, not in yes. any way related to, to yeah. React. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. thank you very much. Yeah, so the last thing just on that module is just because I'd started, so I'll finish. The, the, the styles here are if we have the preprocessor enabled um, and we have a file with dot module and then some CSS, this is going to be a, a localized version of some CSS because with React, out of the box, everything's just global. Um, so what this will actually do is this will allow me to have, for example, mm -hmm. a class called title, which is a very general name and not very good. Um, but by having it in this module, it's localized. So what I can do is I can import in that style. And then this styles object that I import has been generated by the preprocessor. And it will basically have a reference to the, the actual unique name of that style. So it makes it sort of quite easy to pull in uh, localized styles. But again, that depends on what sort of designers you're working with. Uh, I can talk which about this plugin stuff is this day. for the style support? Sorry? Which plugin is this one for the style? Uh, so CS, CSS modules, 
CSS modules. CSS modules, okay, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And if you're using Create React app, uh, like the latest version of Create React app, uh, it will have that wired in and you could you could eject that and look at that for examples as well if you wanted. Cool. Yeah, cool. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Garth because I've been talking too long. Uh, and then at the end, if there's any questions, any more questions, you know, we can do that at the end. Excellent. So, uh, so let me just move on to the uh, the server side of things there. So, as you saw, um, TypeScript is great, and there's an awful lot happening in React. Okay, uh, but let's say you know neither uh, TypeScript nor React. It doesn't matter <laughs> for understanding the uh, the server side of the code because um, we're just going to be thinking in terms of REST and WebSockets. So, um, so let's just think about the architecture again. So we've got the server side of the application, and what we want to have is uh, some standard REST endpoints. Okay, so uh, whenever you log in, or whenever you're trying to add a room or whenever you're trying to send a message to a room, uh, we want these to be standard post requests, you know? So we want to do a, a bog standard uh, uh, HTTP RESTful service, you know, just to handle those. Uh, but then we're also going to need WebSockets, okay? And in particular, we're going to need Fluxes, okay? So WebFlux is called WebFlux because it's all based around a Flux. So uh, uh, a Flux is their word for a reactive stream. So what we're going to need is we're going to need to have reactive streams on the server uh, that WebSockets can communicate, okay? So uh, we'll need to have uh, one flux for sending room updates, okay? So if somebody creates a room, well then uh, we want to go to our reactive stream, uh, our flux for doing room updates and uh, send a message down that. Uh, and then we also want a, a, a flux for each chat room, okay? So let's say we have eight different chat rooms. Well, then we need eight fluxes, okay? Because if somebody sends a, a message to the general chat, well, then we'll send a, um, a message down that flux, okay? So uh, we're going to need a, a standard restful endpoint uh, for logins, adding rooms and sending messages. And then we're also going to need n plus one fluxes, okay, where n is the number of chat rooms, okay. So if we have eight chat rooms, uh, we'll need nine fluxes, uh, one for each chat room, and then an extra one for sending the uh, the updates for room names, okay. So that's the uh, that that's the structure that we need to create, okay. So to do that, uh, we've got a standard Spring Boot project. Um, so I just went to start.spring.io and uh, I just created a new project in Spring Boot. And uh, you see inside there, uh, we've, uh, we've configured it to use WebFlux, you know, the, uh, the, the new web framework based around reactive streams. And we're using Lombok, yeah. And uh, it'll also build in support for, uh, for JUnit as well, JUnit 5, yeah. So, uh, so that was all done for me. And then uh, here's my main package, uh, com.install. And there's a few high level classes and uh, these would stay the same even if it wasn't a chat app, okay? So even if it wasn't a chat app, uh, we would still have these types here. So the first type, uh, this will be immediately obvious to anybody who's done Spring Boot, uh, but just in case you haven't, uh, this is how you kickstart a Spring Boot application. So uh, you have a class with a main method, and inside there, we're handing over control to Spring Boot. So we're, we're handing over control of the main thread to Spring Boot. And then we've got this annotation here, and it's a composite annotation. So whenever you annotate a class with Spring Boot application, you're, it's the same thing as if you'd put these three annotations here on it, okay? So Spring Boot configuration says that the current class is a configuration class. It's a type of Spring Boot component. Uh, we don't need to worry about that. Component scan means look in the current package and all nested packages for any other Spring components, okay? So we're going to look in the current package and nested packages for any Spring components. And then this one here, enable auto configuration, says do magic, <laughs> okay? So uh, depending on what other kinds of Spring components it finds, uh, Spring Boot is going to decide, you know, uh, what it wants to do. Uh, it knows best, it'll decide what actions to take, okay? So this is the, uh, the convention over configuration approach, okay? So based on what Spring Boot finds, uh, it will activate the default conventions, you know, for that type of component. So that, that you know, you, you always have that in a Spring Boot application. Uh, 
Uh, the next one turns on support for cores. So you see here, uh, we're going to be running our uh, the client side, our user interface, our React code. Uh, that's going to be running on localhost 3000. So I, I had to enable cores for that. And uh, that turned out to be a major pain point, which is a, a digression we can get into later if you're interested. Um, and then the final thing here is a little abstraction that we needed to create, okay? So one of the things that you'll either love or hate about WebFlux and uh, WebSockets in particular is that it's fairly low level. You know, you, you do uh, uh, quite a bit of the plumbing yourself, yeah? So what we want is uh, for broadcasting updates about rooms being added and for broadcasting updates about messages uh, being sent to a chat room, uh, we need to have a flux, okay? But a flux is just a communications channel. You know, it, it doesn't spontaneously decide to do anything itself. So what we need to do is we need to set it up so that every time we have a message, uh, waiting to be sent, it gets passed down the flux, okay? So if you just think of the flux as a pipe that's going to connect the server to the client, well, anytime we have something to say, you know, a room has been added, there's a new message in a chat room, uh, we need something that's going to take that message and roll it down the pipe, you know, send it down the flux, okay? So we're creating this arrangement here. So this is a paired queue and flux. So we're going to have a blocking queue, we're going to have a flux and we're going to have an executor service, um, which is the Java 5 wrapper around one or more threads. So what we want to do is we want to set it up that whenever we have something to say, you know, let's say a room has been added. So whenever we have a, a room update message, well, then we are going to put it onto this queue. And then what will happen is the executor service, it will be waiting for things to be added to that queue. And whenever they are, it'll roll them down the flux. You know, it'll send the message down the flux, okay? So if we look at how we achieve this, so our blocking queue is going to be a linked blocking queue. Our executor service is going to be a single thread executor. And this is how we create the flux, okay? So there are two interesting things there to do with the flux. Uh, thing number one, we're saying dot share at the end, okay? So this means that this flux will have multicast functionality, okay? So there can be any number of subscribers to the reactive stream. So anytime we pass a message uh, down the flux, uh, a copy of that message will go to each of the subscribers, okay? So that's why we only need one flux per channel room, okay? So there can be any number of web sockets. You know, we could have thousands of people who have joined the chat room. We could have thousands of web sockets, yeah, but we only need one flux, yeah, because whenever we rule a message down this flux, it'll get shared out, you know, to, to all the subscribers. Uh, and then it's up to us to attach the queue to the flux. So this is how we do it here. You see, we've got this helper method, uh, bind queue to flux. So we take a flux sync object, and then we go and submit a job of work to our executor, okay? So remember the executor is just a wrapper around the thread. Uh, so this is the job of work here that we're going to carry out. So you can see here, we're going to go into an infinite loop and then uh, we're going to wait forever for a message to be put onto the queue, okay? So take here is a blocking operation. So we'll wait as long as it takes uh, for something to be put onto the queue. And then when something's put onto the queue, uh, we'll fire it down the sink, yeah? So whenever we say sync.next, uh, we're sending the, uh, the next message down the flux, okay? So one last time, uh, we've paired three things together. Uh, we've got a blocking queue, we've got a flux, and then we've got an executor service, okay? So the job of the executor service is to wait forever or, or until something is put on the queue. And whenever it's put on the queue, uh, roll it down the, uh, the flux, okay? So this is a standard abstraction that we've created. Uh, slightly surprised that this wasn't built in. You know, this was something that I had to do myself uh, based on a pattern suggested in the examples, you know, but I, I did go out and implement it myself. And um, we could use this for anything, of course. So this is generic code. So this doesn't have to be used for chat messages. Uh, this could be used as for anything at all, okay? So this is the, the general functionality, okay? The, we haven't seen anything yet uh, that's chat specific, okay? Apart from the fact we called it the chat application, you know, but, uh, but nothing so far has been chat specific. So if I go into the chat sub package, uh, we can see the stuff that's needed to make the, uh, the, the chat system work. So first of all, we've got our model folder. 
And inside here, uh, we've got the types that we need, okay? So Eamon was have, able to have great fun with uh, algebraic data types and being able to union things together and do intersections and all that. Uh, I was doing Java, <laughs> okay? So what are we gonna have? We're gonna have get and set methods and constructors and so on, okay? So uh, I'm using Lombok, okay? So uh, what, one of the reasons that as a company in still moved to Kotlin about four or five years ago is we just got uh, bored with all the boilerplate in Java, you know? Uh, but prior to that, we were heavy users of Lombok. So uh, uh, if you haven't used Lombok before, it's definitely worth your time. Uh, it gives you a set of compile time annotations that will generate Java boilerplate for you, okay? So uh, a good way to think about it is that anything that you would previously have generated, you know, uh, using the, uh, the, the code menu, you know, in, in your IDE, uh, using um, one of the, the shortcuts, you know, in IntelliJ. So uh, anything that you would have previously done through the IDE, uh, you can do through the Lombok uh, annotations, or it's just built into the newer languages. You know, it's, uh, it's built into the newer languages like Kotlin, where you have uh, primary constructors and stuff like that. But anyway, so uh, inside this model uh, package, uh, there are the data types that mirror uh, the ones that Eamon was showing you. So we don't need to worry too much about that. Um, so then we've got a configuration class, okay? So uh, in Spring, configuration classes contain bean provider methods, okay? So uh, a bean provider method just builds something on behalf of the rest of the system, you know, on behalf of other components. So you see here, we've got our chat configuration component, and uh, it can, it's got bean provider methods uh, that will build three things. Uh, so we can build a table. Uh, of the current users, yeah. So uh, there, uh, what we're doing is we didn't want to build Spring security into this demo because we figured it was complicated enough already. So all we're doing is we're assigning each user uh, a unique token, okay? So we have a table where the keys are the tokens, you know, assigned to each user and the values are the users themselves. Uh, and then you see we've got this paired queue and flux. Yeah, so this is for room messages, okay? So uh, what's gonna go come down here is room updates for whenever we, uh, we add a room or later on, you know, we might want to add the functionality to delete a room, you know, or change a room's title or whatever. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the paired queue and flux that would be used for that. Garth, uh, there's just a question from uh, Martin here. Uh, yep. Is your code on GitHub? It will be, yes. It will so, be. Uh, so uh, assuming we don't find anything too embarrassing as we go through it, then uh, at the end of this session, uh, we'll put up a, a Git repo containing all of the code and all of the slides. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, so as I say, we've got this paired queue and flux, yeah, and this is what we're going to be sending room messages down, okay? And at the moment, we only have a, a message for adding a room, but we could go on to add one for deleting a room and changing the title and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then finally, uh, we've got a table for the chat rooms themselves, okay? So uh, you see here, we've got a table where the keys are room objects, yeah? So uh, those could have just been strings, but it was, uh, it was easier to create a room class, you know, that just uh, simplified the marshalling to JSON. Uh, and associated with each room is a room resources object, okay? So uh, a room resources object uh, gives us everything we need to manage a chat room, okay? So there are three things that we need. So uh, first of all, uh, we need a, a list of WebSocket sessions, okay? So this will just enable us to track uh, all the WebSockets that are currently using this chat room. Okay? Garth, I will just uh, interrupt you once again before I go past further. Um, there is another question. If you're using Java 14, can you use record, uh, re records instead of Lombok for data objects? You, you could accept that they're immutable. So uh, you, you would need to be sure that um, all of the, the value objects you were going to create uh, would, would be immutable, okay? So, so some of the ones we had here weren't immutable. So that's why I, why I left it with Lombok, yeah? But, uh, but definitely, yes, if you, were, if you had set things up so that all your value objects were going to be immutable, then uh, in Java 14, you could use records. Yeah. Uh, so we've got here uh, a list of WebSocket sessions, yeah, 
and then uh, we've got our message history, okay? So one way that we might want to extend this uh, later on is use some separate tool for storing the messages and uh, making them persistent and so on. So, uh, so we might want to wire in Kafka or something like that, okay? But here we're just doing everything ourselves. We're keeping it all in memory, okay? Uh, so, uh, so we'll need to keep a history of all the messages so that whenever a, a new participant, you know, logs into a room, then uh, we get all the, the uh, history of the messages sent down, okay? So anytime somebody sends us a message, uh, we'll need to put it into the history as well as sending it down the flux, okay? And speaking of the flux, there it is there, okay? So we'll have uh, another of these paired queue and flux thingies, yeah? Uh, so uh, this is going to be a queue and flux of chat messages, yeah? So what we want to do is anytime uh, a message is sent, we want to add it to the history, but then we also want to put it on the queue uh, inside this paired queue and flux. And then as we've said before, there'll be a dedicated thread, which is waiting to take the message off the queue and uh, fire it down the, uh, the flux, okay? Uh, so in the constructor, we create everything and we add a welcome message, okay? So I deliberately put in the welcome message to show you that in Java 14, uh, you have multi-line strings, yeah? So you can do multi-line strings and those multi-line strings can contain the standard uh, printf style placeholders. So here, percent %s for strings, uh, percent %t for time, you know, and so on. So I can take that multi-line string and I can call the formatted method and I can replace the placeholders with the, uh, the values that had been passed in, okay? Uh, so, so that's how we're creating our welcome message back in the constructor. So uh, let's say somebody sends us a message. What do we want to do? Uh, we'll, we'll create a new chat IM object and that's going to contain the text of the message, the user, yeah, and the date on which the, uh, the message was sent. And then we'll take that message and we'll add it to our queue and flux. So as we've said now, there's that thread waiting to, to strip it off the queue and send it down the flux. All good, you know. And then uh, we'll also need to, uh, to add it to our history. Uh, and then let's say somebody joins the room. Well, what do we need to do? Well, uh, we need to take the incoming WebSocket session, okay? So some client has uh, made a WebSocket connection to this chat room. So we'll take the WebSocket session and we'll add it to our list of sessions. And then uh, we'll build some initial messages, okay? So you see here, I'm building a new flux. And this flux is going to be made up of an all IMs message containing the message history so far and a user count message containing the, the current number of sessions, you know, that, that are using this room, okay? So I'm going to take that flux, uh, and this is like the initial set of messages that we want to send to, uh, to each new client. And then we want to concatenate that with the broadcaster. You know, that, that's, the, that's what I've called the flux inside my queue and flux, because it's going to broadcast, you know, uh, everything that goes down the flux to, uh, to all the subscribers. So uh, I'll concatenate uh, those two fluxes together, and I'll return that back, okay? And that will then be what we will use to send data uh, down the web socket to the client, okay? So that, that's uh, all the infrastructure that we needed apart from the endpoints themselves, <laughs> okay? So uh, you know, we've now put all the infrastructure in place uh, to go out and write um, our endpoints, okay? So first of all, uh, I've got this file called chat HTTP services, and uh, this is going to contain the regular RESTful endpoints, okay? So remember we said we'll need a, a regular RESTful service uh, for logging in, adding rooms, sending messages, stuff like that, okay? Uh, so I'm injecting into this my table of users, my table of rooms, and the paired queue and flux that we're using for, uh, for room updates, okay? Uh, and then I'm building a router function. So uh, whenever you're doing web flux, uh, you can build your standard RESTful services using annotations. Yeah, but I'm sure anybody who's done Spring Boot, you'll have seen you'll have seen Spring MVC, you'll have seen that before. Okay, so I wanted to show something a little bit newer. So uh, with web flux, you also have a DSL based approach. Okay, and this is terribly trendy these days. Uh, if you look at Ktor, if you look at HTTP for K, and so on, you know that that's the way that they declare all of their RESTful services. So I've got a little DSL here, and obviously I'm stating the URLs and the HTTP verbs and the value of the accept header and so on. 
So I'm taking the standard information and I'm mapping it to individual functions, okay? So you can see all of these functions declared down here. And uh, the signature of these functions is that they need to take a request and return a mono of a response, okay? So all of these functions need to take a, uh, a request and return a mono of a, uh, of a response, okay? Uh, so let's, uh, let, let me just have a look at some of these. Uh, let's just pick an interesting one. Um, so yeah, so, so let's say we want to uh, add uh, a message, okay? So uh, we want to uh, add a chat message, okay? So um, we take in the request object and we grab the uh, the room bit from the end, okay? So we're going to have the, the room name at the end of the URL. Uh, and then we'll go out and find the user, uh, identify who the, uh, the current user is. And then we'll go to the request and we'll get the body, okay? Now in WebFlux, everything is done using fluxes and monos. So a flux is a reactive stream. A mono is a reactive stream down which zero or one items will pass, okay? So you don't need to worry about a mono. A mono isn't a more complicated version of a flux. It's a simpler version of a flux, yeah? So uh, whenever you're doing web flux, everything is done uh, using fluxes and monos, and everything's done using reactive programming, okay? So I would say, uh, unless you're happy and confident in the basics of functional programming, don't go near web flux, okay? Uh, learn basic FP first of all, okay? So if you're not completely happy with uh, what a flat map is and a map is and a reduce is and all that kind of stuff, uh, then get familiar with that first of all uh, before you go near web flux, okay? Otherwise you'll just find it confusing. So uh, I can get the body of the, uh, the request, but I can get it back as a reactive stream. You know, I can get it back as a flux or mono. So here I'm getting it back as a mono, and then I can flat map over that, okay? So um, I'll get the actual text of the message, and then I'll go out and I'll add that. You know, I'll add that message to the room, and then I want to return a response, okay? So here uh, I'm building a server response whose body, again, it needs to be a, a flux or a mono. So uh, I've got some helper functions to do that for me, okay? But uh, I'm building and returning a, a mono of server response and uh, that'll determine what gets sent back to the client, okay? So uh, uh, again, it's very different uh, in this incarnation from uh, the earlier Spring MVC web framework, okay? You can still use all the Spring MVC based annotations if you want to. Uh, that's, you know, you can still write a, a RESTful controller in the traditional way, uh, but this is the, uh, the, the more modern, or at least the cooler, you know, uh, DSL based approach. So that's, uh, th that's what I wanted to show you. So that, that'll do for our standard endpoints, okay? That'll do for logging in. Uh, that'll do for creating rooms. That'll do for sending messages to rooms, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, but what about the web sockets, okay? So that takes us to our, our final file. And this is chat web socket services, okay? So you can see it here. Uh, so we're, we're following a very similar pattern. Uh, so again, it's a configuration class and I'm injecting my table of rooms and uh, I'm injecting the queue and flux for doing uh, room updates, okay? Uh, and now I want to do WebSocket specific functionality, okay? So first of all, I have to build and return an adapter object for WebSockets. Why? Because them's the rules, <laughs> okay? So uh, th this is something that you might want to configure. I'm not 100% sure what you would reconfigure this for. That's something I have to go out and learn myself, uh, but you're required to provide one of these, okay? So you're required to have a beam provider method uh, that returns uh, a standard adapter object, okay? So, so that's just boilerplate. Uh, and then we're building and returning a handler mapping, okay? So uh, you know, it makes me smile that web sockets are something that's incredibly new and modern and so on. Uh, and yet to register them, I'm using the good old handler mapping that I've been using for 20 years now, <laughs> okay? So uh, handler mapping at the end of the day is just a table uh, where the keys are going to be URLs and the values are going to be handler objects, okay? So a, a handler mapping is just a table where the keys are going to be URLs and the values are going to be some kind of handler object, okay? Uh, 
Uh, so you can see up at the top the two URLs. Yeah. So there's going to be one URL uh, whenever the client has made a WebSocket connection for room updates, and then one when they've made a, a WebSocket connection for uh, messages. Okay. So they want to uh, be sent all the messages uh, in this room here, you know, whatever this path variable name is. Okay. Uh, so I've, uh, I've created my table here. And then you see we've got these two functions, okay? So there's one to build a WebSocket handler for room updates, and there's one to build a, uh, a WebSocket handler for message updates, yeah? So uh, I've got these two functions here that are going to build and return the, uh, the handler objects. So uh, they're returning something of type WebSocket handler. Uh, let's just have a look at that. So, uh, so WebSocket handler is just an interface with a handle method. Okay, so uh, that takes a WebSocket session and returns a mono of void. Okay, now this is where it's worth pausing for a second. Uh, this is in my experience where most people, including myself, screw it up. Okay, uh, so whenever you're working with WebSockets, um, in Webflux, the way it works is you get the WebSocket session, and from this you get two fluxes, okay? One for sending and one for receiving, okay? So you have a flux for receiving things for the client, and you have a flux for sending things to the client, okay? And what you're going to return is you're going to return a link to one of those, okay? Uh, as a mono of void. And in the beginning, I thought this was just a throwaway. You know, I thought that this was just like some kind of weird way of saying void, you know, and it got returned and that was it. Uh, but it turns out that whatever you return, it'll wait for it to close, you know, before it says, right, you're done with the WebSocket. OK, so uh, it'll uh, it'll return that you return this and then it will wait for that to complete. OK, as it says very clearly in the comment, if only I had actually read the comments associated with these things. OK, so uh, it's very easy to accidentally return a reference to the uh, the wrong flux and therefore get your web socket closing early and so on okay so that's a that's something to watch out for um, and then just before we look at these uh, the implementations of these two here and that'll be the final bit of the code uh, whenever you return a, a handler mapping yeah you have to give it an order okay because we could have any number of being provider functions that we're building and returning handler mappings okay so you have to return the order okay it's not optional now you would assume it's optional because it's a set method you know it's not passed in in the constructor but if you leave it out it doesn't work okay and uh, that, that's something I knew 10 years ago but I had forgotten until I wrote this demo and that's uh, that's three hours of my life I'm not getting back and I'm in no way bitter about that whatsoever okay uh, so uh, so yeah uh, if you look at all the demos and all the tutorials and so on uh, they'll all call set order yeah but none of them say it's mandatory uh, it was for me <laughs> okay so, uh, so so that's something to note so again if we just go and look at this uh, so we've got these functions here and uh, these are going to return handlers okay so uh, I could return um, uh, I could return uh, objects that implemented the interface, but this is Java 14. Yet let's use lambdas, okay? So this WebSocket handler interface, it contains a single abstract method. There is one with a default implementation, you know, but it has a single abstract method and therefore it's automatically a functional interface. You know, uh, it's automatically compatible with lambdas. Uh, so what do I want to do? Well, I want to extract the name of the room from the URL Look at that in a minute. Uh, and then uh, I'll go to my table of rooms and get the appropriate room resources. Yeah. Having done that, I'll go to it and say, hey, I want to join. So I'll pass in the session object associated with the current WebSocket, and it'll return a flux of messages that I can use to send things down to the, uh, the client. Okay. So I can go to my session and I can say session.send and pass in the flux. Okay. So this flux that's been built for me uh, by the room resources object, this is the one that will be used to stream uh, messages down to the, uh, the client. Okay. Uh, it turns out there's an interesting pain point there in uh, extract room name. So if you look at this WebSocket handler, it's a fairly pure interface. You know, you get a WebSocket session and uh, you return a mono avoid. Yeah, it turns out there's no easy way of getting at the URL. So whenever you're given a WebSocket session, there's no easy way of getting the URL. 
uh, there is a hack, <laughs> okay? So uh, if we look down here at uh, extract room name, you can see that I'm taking my session and uh, this is being done using Project Reactor running on top of the Netty server, okay? So uh, uh, Spring Webflux, you know, it uses Project Reactor, which is Pivotal's reactive services toolkit, and it runs on top of the Netty server. So you see here, I can take my session object and uh, I can cast it to being a Reactor Netty WebSocket session, because that's what it is at the minute. And then uh, I can go to that and I can say, give me the handshake info and then give me the URI and then give me the path. OK, so that will give me the, uh, the URL as a, uh, as a string. And then I can use a helper class yeah, to lift out the, uh, the bit at the end. OK, I can use the helper class to lift out the, uh, the path variable, you know, the, the name bit. OK, but again, that, that was uh, another little difficulty, you know, that I uh, uh, had to find my way around. Not a particularly hard thing, but just a, just a little annoyance. Uh, and then the, the one for building the, uh, the handler for rooms, uh, that's even simpler, okay? So uh, we're just going to uh, return this little lambda here, and we're going to build a flux of WebSocket messages, and uh, this is for room updates, yeah? And then uh, again, we'll say session.send. So we'll say, okay, uh, please take this flux here as the output. Uh, whatever gets sent down this flux, uh, please write it down to the, uh, the client. So that's it. So that those are all the types and the application. You know, that's the, uh, the the server side code in a nutshell. And you can launch it in the usual way. You know, I have it running here. So uh, you can launch it in the usual way, uh, assuming you're doing Gradle, by just going into the application task and double clicking and boot run, you know, and uh, it should just start right up. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's how we implemented the, uh, the, the server side. Uh, just to say, things we didn't have time to do, <laughs> okay? So, uh, you know, the, this was kind of a, a skunk works project. We were doing this in our spare time. So uh, ha if we had time to extend it further, uh, what would we have done, okay? Uh, well, we could have stored the messages in a, uh, a new SQL database, yeah? So uh, if you go and look at start.spring.io, Spring Data now has reactive plugins for all the new SQL databases, you know? So the way that the, the new SQL vendors are trying to distinguish themselves, yeah, is by providing support for reactive streams. So that would have been a fun thing to do. Uh, another thing that would have been interesting is as of uh, fairly recently, just a month or two ago, I think, uh, Spring has support for R2DBC, okay? So R2DBC is the emerging uh, standard for adding reactive support to relational databases, you know? So you can send a, a query to your relational database. And uh, let's say there are 10 results and it takes three seconds to generate each one. Well, instead of having to wait 30 seconds to get back all the results, uh, you can get them back uh, incrementally, you know? So we, uh, we would have loved to have played with that, yeah? Or uh, another thing, uh, there's an emerging standard called RSocket, and this tries to give you higher level support for reactive streams, okay? So this will give you uh, a reactive stream from client to server and from server to client, and it tries to abstract you from the transport protocol. So it can run over web sockets, yeah, but it can also run over raw TCP. It can use the Aeron library, if you're familiar with that, you know? So that's, a, that's another thing that we're itching to play with, you know, but we just uh, didn't have time, okay? So just a few conclusions. Uh, I'll do uh, some on the server side and then Eamon can do some on the client side. So, uh, you know, the, the story of reactive programming is, yeah, it's the only way if you want to be like Netflix. So uh, if you're going to have thousands of connections and clients, if you're going to be working with huge volumes of data and so on, well then, uh, you know, re reactive is the only game in town. Uh, but it requires quite a bit of technical expertise, you know, uh, it requires quite a bit of deep understanding of functional programming, even before you start going near the reactive stuff. 
And the danger is that your code is going to be more uh, complex. You're going to fragment your business logic. Uh, the problem domain will be obscured, all this kind of thing, you know? So, you know, does it spark joy? You know, is this something that you really need? You know, do, do you really need to be Netflix? You know, everybody instinctively says yes, but uh, in most cases, the answer is no, <laughs> okay? And uh, they, they've thought really hard about Webflux. You know, Webflux is extremely comprehensive, extremely powerful, extremely testable. You know, I've, I've never found anything that it can't do, uh, but it's also baffling. It's a little bit inconsistent and it's very low level. OK, so you have to work for this, you know. So uh, what we would use uh, in our demos and in our, our little uh, things that we would use in workshops, you know, uh, we would use Ktor, for example, uh, which builds everything through uh, a DSL. And uh, I find that an awful lot easier to work with, you know, and um, uh, also HTTP for K and stuff like that, you know? So uh, so definitely uh, I worked harder in this uh, than I, I think I would have worked if I was using uh, other frameworks, yeah? So uh, but very much swings and roundabouts. I think part of the problem, in fairness to Webflux, is that it reminded me of Angular. I remember uh, I wrote the first version of our Angular course when Angular 2 was going through its release candidates. And if you remember, there were like uh, seven release candidates. So there were a shed load of tutorials uh, that didn't really agree with each other, you know, so you would search for something uh, uh, on the web and uh, how do I do X in Angular 2? And, uh, you know, you'd come back with seven different answers, you know, all of which might work or some of which worked with some version or give you a different perspective or whatever, but you didn't get what one unified view of how to do it, you know, so that's uh, that seems to be where Webflux is at the minute. Right, so Eamon, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, TypeScript and React then? Yeah, so I'm a big fan of TypeScript. I think it sort of brings sanity to the JavaScript platform. I like job, modern JavaScript. I like as well, but TypeScript just brings that sanity layer. Uh, hopefully people recognize the photo on the right there. Um, it's a really, really powerful type system. Um, for Gotopia, we're doing a comparison of um, TypeScript and, and Kotlin JS uh, for front-end development. And again, there's things that I don't have in Kotlin that I have in TypeScript uh, that are really, really useful. And they can help when you're, well, definitely when you're consuming libraries, the libraries will definitely make a lot of use of these advanced features. But as you get more comfortable with uh, some of the more complicated bits of the type system, you can use it in your own APIs. And therefore you can have your cake and eat it. You can have really succinct code and safety. Getting there is a bit of work and you, it, it does take a bit of time to, to get really comfortable with say unions and intersections and map types and conditional types and some of these advanced things but for me it's it's definitely definitely worth it and it uh you know you have a lot of times you have the succinctness of javascript but the safety of of other languages if you want to flick on there garth yep absolutely and then in terms of ooh, mm, not so <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so React, yeah, I like React as well. Um, it's just Vue, so it gets out of your way so you can pull in other libraries. That's that's a double-edged thing because it means you have to make more decisions. But as a, as a Vue library, it's really good. It's really fast, really succinct. Um, the tooling around it's really good. The TypeScript support is really good. Redux, again, with Toolkit, that's got a lot easier. Um, and if you've any so if you've any so size of app, I would recommend that you use some state management, you know, Mobax or Redux or something like this. Um, Redux is, is is pretty good though, um, and the toolkit makes it a lot easier. Um, but the way we've done it is, you know, very low level. We're using low level web sockets that we've coded, um, and we're doing all the state management with Redux and things like that. Some of the guys internally have been using Firebase, and the support the integration with that with React is very nice because you can basically have all of your state in your persisted store. And then re you can have your React bound to that. And as that data changes, your React app's updating it. It takes care of all of the web sockets and the handshaking and all of that stuff for you. So um, maybe if we do this again, we'll, we'll do it in Firebase instead. 